Services. Welcome to the 411 on 420, the podcast that brings together experts from the cannabis field and our industry attorneys to discuss the business of cannabis and how the legal landscape affects the market. From CEOs to advocates and CBD to THC, this podcast sheds light on this growing industry. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the ones of Perkins Coie, and they should not be considered legal advice. Welcome to Cannabis Legal Highlights, 411 on the 420, the official Perkins Coie Cannabis Industry Group podcast. I am your host, Barack Cohen, and I'm here today with our guest, Andrew Klein, the Director of Public Policy for the National Cannabis Industry Association. So just a few words about the NCIA. It was founded in 2010, and it's the youngest and largest cannabis trade association in the U.S., and the only organization representing state-sanctioned cannabis-related businesses at the federal level. Its mission is, and I quote, to promote the growth of a responsible and legitimate cannabis industry and work for a favorable social, economic, and legal environment for that industry in the United States. And it's described itself as the only industry-led organization engaging in industry efforts to expand and further legitimize the legal cannabis market in the U.S. And today, Andrew is going to talk to us about his job, the state of the cannabis industry at large, and hopefully some of his well-informed predictions about what's going to happen in the cannabis industry. Just to give you full disclosure, I sit on the NCIA's Policy Council, which makes me incredibly biased, both with respect to the NCIA and also with respect to Andrew. I have personally witnessed him at work, and I can tell you that he knows what he's talking about, and we're very happy to have him here and have him share his time with you. Thanks, Brock. So, Director of Public Policy, so what is that? What do you do? We do a number of things, but I, I lead something called the Policy Council. And we together, well, let me just say, we reformed the Policy Council in April of 2019 when I first started at NCIA. It was somewhat dormant, but now we're a group of about 40 cannabis entrepreneurs, chairs of cannabis practices like you, except not quite as debonair, of course, and some doctors and scientists and researchers Uh, And I lead this group to do a number of things uh, on behalf of the industry. We file public comments to executive branch agencies on issues that are important to the industry. We draft uh, white papers on issues ranging from a federal regulatory plan, which we published October of 2019, to, you know, what we think the effective uh, tax rate should look like to the medicine of cannabis, which is a paper we're working on now, all to inform and influence members of Congress and executive branch agencies, industry stakeholders on matters critical to the future of the industry. We've also stood up task forces to address critical issues. So uh, last year, we set up a task force on on safe vaping and on the illicit uh, market crisis that the industry has been dealing with. We provide technical assistance to Congress. So whenever Congress has questions or wants assistance on legislation, we do that. And we produce events. Uh, Yesterday, we produced a public policy summit. So we brought together all of the state regulators and uh, 70 cannabis executives to have a conversation about harmonizing state regulations and and what happens when the federal government finally steps in, you know, who who has what piece of the pie. And I used to do regular public speaking, but that's, that's all dried up because of COVID. So, so I, I want to put a pin on your efforts at influencing for a second because that really, really interests me. But before we get to that, I think the natural question for me anyway is how do you get into that? What have you done to prepare yourself for the role? You know, in some ways, I've, I've been prepared by every job that I've, that I've had. You know, I've, I've spent my entire career kind of bouncing between public policy and law. And uh, certainly my time in in two branches of the federal government gave me a window into how the sausage is made. On the law side, I spent 14 years at DOJ where many of the cannabis decisions are being made. And I I also spent a considerable amount of time in public policy roles. So I worked for for Biden when he was in the Senate and I worked for Biden when he was uh, vice president. I also led public policy for the GoDaddy operating company, which is a domain name registrar. And I taught public policy at American University. And I always say every time I speak that I'm also a student of uh, democracy. And my feeling is that Thomas Jefferson would be doing backflips if he could see this democratic capitalism flourishing in 36 states. So it's all just, you know, every piece of my career has, has just is colliding at the same time. Was it a planned thing or was it just something that happened fortuitously? It really wasn't. You know, I was, I was, uh, I had, I knew nothing about the cannabis industry three and a half years ago. 
And I was sitting in my office working at the FCC on an investigation and my phone rang. And it was, you know, a call from a recruiter who said that there was a new self-regulatory organization that was being formed and they were looking for a former federal prosecutor to run it. And at the time, you know, I had no plans to enter the cannabis industry, but my wife was an executive at Verizon and she was commuting from D.C. to New York. And it was it was a hardship on our family and just not at all where I wanted my life to be. And she had said to me, half kidding, I think, but, you know, if you're willing to move to Denver, uh, where my sister is, I'm, I'm willing to leave my job. And so it, it became apparent that, that this SRO position as president could be based in Denver. And so that was my, my first, you know, the, the thing that I found at least initially intriguing was I could get my wife to slow down and we could move to Colorado. But then as I started thinking about it, you know, it just, it made so much sense because, you know, I've spent my life in law enforcement and public policy, and this was this was a marriage of, of everything. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm reminded of something that one of my professors told me in law school. And, and some of you may know I'm a veteran. I used to be a professional soldier, went to West Point, all that stuff. And that all happened, obviously, before I went to law school. And so I was complaining to my professor about how difficult certain paths I wanted to take would be after law school. And he he slowed me down. He said, you know, you, you have to stop thinking of your professional life as landing at Omaha Beach and fighting your way to Berlin. Things happen along the way. Opportunities open. It's a meandering path and you have to be open to it. Um, and I, for, I am just echoing what, what you just said. I certainly could not have predicted where I am today. Even even in law school, I had no idea that this would be the path I would take. Certainly not when I was in the Army. Yeah, it's actually really good, great advice. You know, I, I've in the past had the view that people who had very linear careers were, were more successful. You know, someone who knew that they wanted to be an employment lawyer, for instance, you know, right out of law school. But for me, that wasn't the path I took. And, and it's, I think I got a little bit lucky, but all, all things t- seem to be kind of heading in the, in the, in the right direction. Yeah, I think so. Um, certainly you hear doing the podcast. So I think so. <laughs> it's all kind of brought you here. Um, so here, here's the piece I'm interested in and your role uh, in public policy. So actually influencing people who can pull the levers of power. Does it work? You know, I have this vision of people in public policy. Sometimes when I'm being especially cynical, it seems like an echo chamber, Um, an an echo chamber with, with white papers, you know, flitting around the room. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, lawyers and policy experts like to talk and they certainly like to talk to each other. And, you know, we saw some of that yesterday when, when we had this summit and that's, you know, that's a challenge. But I think for people who really understand uh, what public policy is, they get that it does impact the bottom line of companies um, and the public perception of companies. And for CEOs who really understand that, it becomes critical work on, on, on the private sector side. And then for Congress, you know, I think it's, you know, democracy is an active sport. And and Congress has some expertise on some issues, but not expertise on every issue. And they really need the expertise of the outside private sector to educate them. And I think the MORE Act is, you know, a pretty good example of that. It's 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 a good bill, but it's not a great bill in, in its drafting and could have used some expertise from people like you. Mm-hmm. So you brought it up and it was going to come up anyway, the MORE Act. So this is a very timely conversation. For people who may not know, can you explain what the act is and why, at least symbolically and maybe more than symbolically, although you and I think need to kind of unpack that, why it's important? Yeah. Look, I mean, the MORE Act is a descheduling bill. And that, it to me, is the most important piece of the puzzle for the cannabis industry. And we can get into that in a minute, you know, why I believe that we have to deschedule ultimately in order to be successful. You know, this bill did a couple of important things. It, it descheduled cannabis, but it also provided some relief for those who have been impacted on the war on drugs. And and that's really critically important um, as we move forward. Unfortunately, about 48 hours or or so before the bill was introduced, there was an, excuse me, before the bill went to the floor, there was a manager's amendment that was introduced that created some new federal criminal penalties that prohibited people who have a prior felony conviction from entering uh, the cannabis industry, which is kind of antithetical to to the whole purpose behind descheduling and a descheduling bill. 
And so, you know, I think we made, we made some, some steps forward this week, but it also became readily apparent that the industry needs to coalesce and we need to start helping Congress a little bit more. Well, that's, that's interesting. What, what do you mean by coalesce? And I mean, I think what you're talking about are fracture lines in the industry. What are the fracture lines and how does the industry coalesce despite the the fractures? So, you know, it's a great question. There, there are, there are a few different buckets of groups in the cannabis industry. There are multi-state operators. There are craft cannabis companies, which are going to be increasingly more important. You know, intellectual property and brands are going to be very important as we move forward. There are very educated consumers, and then there are very educated and very passionate advocates. And those four groups don't always align on policy. But I'll give you an example. When, when COVID first hit, there was a, a, a relief package. I forget what it was called, the very first relief package that was being proposed. And some of the MSOs were, 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 were arguing for 280E relief, which I understand. It's, it's the biggest issue facing the industry. We've got to fix the IRS provision 280E so that big companies are not paying or, or anybody, any company is not paying an effective 80% tax rate. I mean, it's just, it's unfair. It's absurd. It's unsustainable, but it wasn't exactly germane to a COVID relief package. On the other hand, some advocacy groups, including ours, were advocating for safe banking. And to me, that made a lot more sense because we're in the middle of a pandemic. We've got an industry that's relying on cash, which is dirty. We had governors who were allowing transactions to take place in parking lots because they didn't want people going inside. And so you had cash transactions happening in parking lots, which was sort of both dangerous from a public safety perspective, but also unhealthful from a public health perspective. And so it seemed to me, at least, readily apparent and obvious that the the germane issue was safe banking. And so my point is, you know, it would have been more helpful for the industry to be coalescing around one issue and lobbying Congress on that one issue, because unless we're in agreement on what we want and we're all going after it, Congress is never going to know what to prioritize. So, you know, I'd like to see the industry making concerted efforts to row in the same direction. So an interesting question, I think, related to that is social equity. And we had Natalie Papillon from The Last Prisoner Project. She did our second podcast and and Yoko Miyashita of Leafly did her first. And I've been making a concerted effort to talk about social equity in, in each of these because I think it's important, objectively. It's my little contribution. But there are people who say that overemphasis on social equity really holds back the industry with respect to legalization. And let me be clear, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, yeah, the social equity stuff is just a bad thing. They're, they're talking from a pragmatic perspective. No, of course, of course. And, you know, it's, you just, you just stated it very plainly. And it's, it's true that it is a challenge because we have two things going on at the same time. We have business necessity happening. Right. Where where people who are investing millions of dollars in their businesses can't get a bank account, can't take small business deductions, don't know whether a federal government agency is going to come raid their property. Like we are dealing with real substantive issues and a 15 billion dollar industry like this is a serious industry. At the same time, we have people who, you know, have spent time in prison for the same conduct that is now you know, making people rich. And that's not fair. So what you've, what you've pointed out is a real issue that we need to tackle. And we need to solve both problems simultaneously. And both of them are nuanced. So it's not going to be easy. But we do need to retro- retroactively expunge criminal records. And we do need to fund and support social equity programs. And so, you know, I think it's hard to do those two things unless you have a social equity plan baked into a piece of legislation. And so from my perspective, it, it you know, that piece of legislation has to be a descheduling bill because just providing protection like the States Act to businesses at the state level doesn't do anything to fix prior wrongs. And so you really need to to legalize in order to to support social equity programs, and then you need to fund them. Um, and that money, you know, needs to come from regulation and tax. And the only way that happens at the federal level is if you do schedule. So, you know, it, it, they are, you know, they are colliding and they are, you know, the equities are very different, but I do think that they need to be married. 
you know, we need to make sure that people who are disenfranchised have the same opportunities as everyone else, which is why it's so surprising to me to see that manager's amendment containing a provision prohibiting anyone with a prior felony conviction from getting a license. It's so antithetical to the Morax core purpose. We can't seriously debate cannabis reform, I don't think, without seriously debating criminal justice reform or social justice reform. Yeah, from my two cents, I, 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 I agree with all that. And I will, I'll add also that it is very, even if there is a commitment to social equity, you can't, it's very difficult to back into it. You, you have to, you have to frame it from the outset for it to make sense and be efficient and, and really work much, much harder to back into it. I know at least one of the states has tried back. I'm trying to remember which state it was backed into it rather than baking it into um, legalization. And they've had a, they've had an enormous, enormously difficult. I think it's Washington, Washington backed into it, I believe. So Massachusetts looked forward uh, and you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure uh, Massachusetts decided more or less from the outset that social equity was the way to go. Whereas Washington, when it legalized, backed into it and has had difficulties for that reason. Yeah, and I know, you know, Illinois baked it in early too, and, and they've been doing, you know, I think objectively a good job at, at trying to move the ball forward, but, you know, still lots of work to do. Yep, for sure. So what about other areas? What So we've talked about the Safe Banking Act, which, by the way, is, you know, legislators have been talking about for a long time. And there's been bipartisan Bipartisan support voiced uh, for voiced in terms of its importance, and everybody, my God, FinCEN has guidelines for 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 marijuana banking. You know, even though it's putatively illegal, what's uh, what's keeping that from happening? It seems so <sighs> obvious. You know, <laughs> Barack, it's a great question, and I just don't, I don't understand it. I really don't. I don't understand the politics of this issue. It's, it's, you know, we talked about this before. It's unsafe to operate an all-cash business. It's unsanitary to operate an all-cash business. Medical cannabis is legal in 36 states at this point. You know, the United Nations has, has rescheduled uh, cannabis. The House passed banking overwhelmingly, like bipartisan vote. And, you know, it, it's time for Congress to act on this issue. I think that this is the one issue that could see bipartisan support in the next Congress in 2021, partially because Mike Crapo will be gone and it, it's looking like Pat Toomey will be taking over if the, if the Republicans take over the Senate and he is not going to run for reelection in 2022. So I think there are some opportunities for the cannabis industry, you know, to work with, with Pat Toomey, who, who has signaled too, that, that he may be open to having this conversation, but you know, I don't, it, it just, it just, you know, you said it at the outset, Barack, I just don't think there should be a partisan issue. I can understand why descheduling would be a partisan issue, of course, or even a controversial issue, right? I mean, you're talking about legalizing something that's been a controlled substance for 30 years. I get it. But supporting a $15 billion, and by the way, I forgot to mention, we're going to be in a recession in, in January or February. You know, we're going to see 50% of, of restaurants going out of business, I think. And so we're going to need industries like the cannabis industry that have created 250,000 jobs and that have you know been pouring money into the you know state coffers we're going to need businesses like the cannabis industry to help save our economy and the only way that happens is if people open bank accounts <laughs> you know it's not that complicated so you've opened the door to the predictive part of our discussion i think what do you see happening going forward? In short, I think we're going to fare very well. I really do. It may take some time, but I do think we're going to be fine. In, in the short term, I think it's completely dependent on the election in Georgia. If we win those two Senate seats, I think the industry is off to the races. I think the likelihood of that happening is pretty slim, the Democrats winning winning both seats. In the more medium term, you know, Biden has signaled that he wants more research. So while we wait for a democratically controlled Senate, we should give him what he wants. I don't think we should push him any harder than where he is. And at this time, he wants more research. So let's help him. Let's help him, you know, get to a good place on, on rescheduling if that's what it takes in the short term to get this research done. And in time, I have every confidence he's going to do the right thing. I mean, you know, do I think that if the House and the Senate were to pass a descheduling bill? Do I think he would veto it? No, I really don't. But he's not going to be a proponent of it. 
And so, and we know the sen- the the Republican controlled Senate isn't either. And so, you know, let's let's embrace his plan and and give him the research that he wants. I do have one, you know, concern, and that is, you know, he's talked about re rescheduling, and and you know, so far with a wink and a nod, we've been in Schedule One, but we really haven't, right? Because the, f- the feds haven't been taking any action against any of the state legal businesses. But once we reschedule to Schedule Two, that's a pretty clear signal that that's where we are. And I just want to make sure we're not creating a prescription drug model for the industry. I want to make sure that we're, we're not saying, okay, we're going to hand this over to FDA. There are going to be expensive clinical trials. The medical programs that exist in the states are no longer going to exist. And you're going to have to go to the pharmacy you know, to get your cannabis and then maybe an aisle 11, you can get your CBD, but, but you have to go to. That strikes me as part of the challenge with, with cannabis generally. You can see it with CBD. I think most obviously it's not, it's hard to pigeonhole when you, if you're talking, we'll, we'll talk about marijuana for a second. So if you're talking about marijuana, it's recreational, it's medicinal. It's something components of it. The FDA already addresses, right? And I understand the concern you're raising and I agree, but it's, it's very much like the concern with what's happening with, with CBD because of the drug exclusion rule, the FDA, the FDA has certain, certain policies about po- certain things that institutionally it feels it has to do with respect to regulating CBD generally. And that creates all kinds of complications when at the end of the end of the day, you might be talking about something that's simply a, uh, an additive to a beverage as opposed to a, uh, something that affects a, a human structure and function. You mentioned Biden's current desire for research and focus on at least, I think you mentioned a temporary focus or at least a current focus on the possibility of rescheduling. Um, how do you, I mean, I, I'm trying to imagine what rescheduling a schedule two or a schedule three even looks like in particular schedule two. Uh, how do you, what does that do to the recreational market? I think it's an open question. And that's kind of what I was alluding to on the medicinal side. But, you know, he, he has said that he's going to respect states' rights on the recreational side. So to me, that sounds like the States Act and making sure that DOJ doesn't take enforcement actions against state legal businesses. But at the same time, he said he's going to legalize medicinal and reschedule. And so I think we need to work out those sort of finite details. How do those all work? You know, what can be done through executive order or administrative rulemaking? What needs congressional action? You know, I think those are the kinds of details that still need to be sorted out. So let's pop back to the Moore Act for a second and federal federal legalization. When I get questions you know, from people in my firm or clients, even when do you think, when do you think cannabis will be federally legal? I, I almost feel like saying, you know, I, I have my own prediction. Usually it's like, it's like driving on the freeway in LA. Everything is 15 minutes apart. I think I always say three or four years, depending on <laughs> I don't know, three years, four years, but I almost feel like saying, look, I don't know how relevant it's. Of course it's important, but, and it'll be a huge boon to the industry. But there's already an industry, and it's already finding ways to function at the state level. And, it's, uh, and cannabis is already here, and it's significant. So it's almost there. It, it, it always seems that there are more relevant daily questions aside from federal legalization, as important as that ultimately may be. Yeah, look, I, I agree to a certain extent um, that you know we've made a lot of progress without it, right? Without descheduling, without legalization. And so far, the federal government has taken a hands-off approach to those state businesses. But we are still left in this conflict, this federal-state conflict that makes it very difficult. We don't have interstate commerce. And, you know, that's important because, you know, for a manufacturer in, in New York, you know, it's expensive, right, to build a, a, a greenhouse um, or a, you know, indoor grow facility, to lay out that kind of capital when if we had interstate commerce, you know, people could be growing the best cannabis outdoors in California and Oregon and shipping it to New York, you know, 280E, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge problem, which, and and there's some disagreement, I think about whether 280E gets fixed. If we reschedule to schedule two, Uh, there's some thought that we would need to reschedule to schedule three in order for, for 280E to get fixed. You know, banking, we talked about earlier, social equity reforms, we talked about earlier. The DEA, we really don't want or need the DEA in cannabis 
you know, it, this is a public health issue. Uh, this is plant-based medicine. And so we'd really like to see the FDA um, or a public health agency in charge of this. And, and unless you deschedule, the DEA remains in, in, in charge um, or at least has a role to play. You know, so, so there are myriad reasons why, why we do need some legislative action. And I think in the first instance, it starts with what the president-elect wants, and that's research. So, Andrew, we've been talking about the future, and I think it's impossible to talk about the future of the industry in particular, without talking about the pandemic more broadly and how it has affected things. How do you think the pandemic will affect the cannabis industry? It's a great question, Brock. You know, I think I think it already actually has affected the industry. I mean, you know, we saw it when, when COVID first hit, most governors made cannabis essential, like gasoline and, and food and alcohol. And then since then, we've seen, you know, sales... Uh, have been through the roof for the past eight months, particularly here in Colorado and I know in California. And then, we, you know, we've seen governors loosening some restrictions around curbside delivery and home delivery and online uh, ordering. And, and I suspect that those kinds of things will probably stay in place because they're working. But, you know, come January, my guess is we're going to be in a recession and we're going to see some you know, some industries really hurting, like the restaurant industry, I think could be in a real world of hurt in the spring. So I think the real question is, you know, h- how will our economy uh, be helped by cannabis? Because we're on pace to do $15 billion in, in revenue this year. We've created a quarter million jobs. We're on pace to do $34 million by 2024. And we have, you know, one of the most reliable, resilient, recession-proof industries out there. And so we have to make policy decisions that support rather than hinder growth. And then we'll be off to the races. So, you know, I think, you know, the pandemic has already affected the industry. And I think that the industry is going to have some positive impact on the negative impact of the pandemic, if that makes sense. Like, I think that because of the pandemic, we're we're seeing some negative economic implications. And I think the cannabis industry could be in a position to help. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope we, you know we we get a chance in the future to have you back to talk about the next big thing that happens in the cannabis industry. Thanks, Barack, and I appreciate your leadership uh, on the Policy Council and also, also as the chair of the Cannabis Practice from Perkins Coie. You guys are doing great work, and it's not going unnoticed. Thank you, and uh, thank you, and you're welcome. We're, we're glad to be involved. It's it's a real opportunity for us. <laughs>